So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Leif Johnson, who is a professor of anthropology in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Um, Leif specializes in a number of things, including political culture, play and sports, the Eomian ethnic group, um, anthropological theory and comparisons, ethnography, and Southeast Asia more generally, and Thailand in particular. Um, Leif received his BA in anthropology in 1986 from the University of Iceland, where he, he is an original, originally from Iceland. In, later he went, uh, came to the United States and of course, and went, did his MA, which he completed in 1988 at the University of Iowa and then went on to do his PhD at uh, Cornell University, also in anthropology, uh, completing his PhD in 1996. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about four, what I consider to be four sort of areas that I know Leif's work of, that I'll just talk a little bit about now. Actually, when I, I first heard of Leif's work when I was starting to work in Ratnakiri in uh, northeastern Cambodia because uh, I got there, started to work there in about 1995, but Leif had already been there a few years earlier. So one of the early, you know, following the uh, the UNTAC period, or in, during the UNTAC period, Leif was uh, there with one of the first NGOs to go work in uh, Ratnakiri, and at that time, uh, Health Unlimited was, uh, this British NGO was getting started there and they had a, an interesting approach that they were actually going to bring in people to do anthropology on health before sort of starting into community-based activities and there were a few different uh, anthropologists that they got to come and do that work and Leif was one of those. So I was already uh, reading his work when it was sort of in report form back then and then he had a book chapter that he wrote uh, in 1997, which was very influential to me personally. Um, he was, at that time, I think, you know, had some of the most interesting insights into the indigenous peoples of northeastern Cambodia, going around the in particular. Uh, ethnic, ethnic Pampuan and Gurung people, I guess you would say. So after that, though, Leif moved on and did not do his PhD research in northeastern Cambodia, but moved on to Thailand, into northern Thailand, where he worked with the Eomian. And that's sort of the main ethnic group that Leif is now sort of associated with as a scholar. And he uh, did his PhD research with Eomian communities in northern Thailand. And then uh, after completing his PhD and later, um, his book came out in 2002 called Mian Relations, Mountain People and State Control in Thailand. So that's a very significant book, if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, in terms of you know, me and people in Thailand. Um, the third area that I'll mention is that uh, Leif, through his work with Yomian, also got interested in thinking about uh, sports and play. So thinking about the role of sports in the socio-political lives of ethnic minorities in their interactions with the state or people, government officials and others. Um, and that work, um, you know, I, is, is another area that he's done a significant amount of uh, research on. Also mainly focused in Northern Thailand. And then finally, um, uh, Leif became very involved after the 2009 release of the Ardenach the Art of Not Governing, um, which is sort of the book about Zomia. Um, Leif became engaged in thinking about uh, James Scott's way of thinking about Zomia and wrote some influ influential pieces about this. Um, one in 2010 in the Journal of uh, History and Anthropology, and in 2012 in Critique and Anthropology, and then finally followed up with uh, his 2014 book, Slow Anthropology, Negotiating Differences with the Eomian, that was published by the Cornell Southeast Asian Studies Program. And essentially, um, 
I would say that Leif has provided the most theoretically rich um, critique of the idea of Zomia, which I personally um, appreci I've appreciated for many years and have recommended to a lot of different students and others over the years and have referenced a number of times. I think that Leif's critique of um, the, 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 some of the ways that Zomia has been presented you know, are very important and valuable for us to think about and the way that upland, lowland relations actually occur as opposed to where, how they're sometimes imagined through the, the, the view of, of Zomia. So today we're going to hear something different from Leif and uh, I'm sure it's going to be great as usual because Leif is a very established scholar with a great theoretical knowledge even from the very early days of my reading my, his work. I was always impressed by his theoretical accomplishments. So with all, uh, let's give Leif a great hand and, and, and welcome him to the Well, thank you. Thank you, Ian, for a very generous and substantial introduction. Thank you to the center for uh, making available an affiliation that has me here for a semester. And thank you to Mary and Lizzie and Sam for office magic and Mike for the office magic that means academics can do their stuff. So, <laughs> so I went to Cambodia in 92, uh, just about 30 years ago, January, and the country was just opening up. I wasn't planning to go there, but Ian brought this up and there's a story. So I had been applying for grants to do my dissertation research in Thailand because that was the only country that was open in mainland Southeast Asia. And uh, I wasn't having any luck. And then somebody called me up. I'm not the guy they called first. So somebody they really wanted to do this research in Northeast Cambodia had been signed up and then he got a great offer from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I'm the other guy, the <laughs> guy you call when you don't get the one you want. <laughs> so, so you couldn't fly from Ithaca to uh, Phnom Penh. So I flew to Bangkok. And then, you know, the country is just opening up. And there was a rickety plane from Bangkok to Phnom Penh. And you come in, and you see an airstrip. And you see the cows walking back and forth over the airstrip and so on. And, and you sort of pray. And we landed, and we get into this, like, it looked like a little school building in the middle of a rice field, painted socialist yellow. And there were five rickety school desks. And the customs guards were there. And I was the first person off the plane. There was like 50 people. And, and then I'm standing there. And everybody is through except me. And they're looking at my passport. Now, the five customs guards are all looking at it. And he's turning it upside down, back to front. And then he gives it back to me and says, Islam may exist the bar. There is no Iceland. You're from a fake country. <laughs> because Cambodia had been isolated for so long because of war and then US authoritarianism that they knew of America, Holland, Australia, France, and Sweden. They'd never heard of the rest of the world. It had been erased for 30 years. So there I was from a non-existent country. And, uh, and I was standing there. My heart sank. They were going to send me back home. And then, because this is 1992, there was no security. So a Dutch woman who spoke Khmer had been sent from the city to pick me up at the airport. And she just walked to the customs guys through the airport. There is no security. And her paperwork matched mine. And she said, you know, he's actually from a real country. And this paper from the ministry is actually a real paper. So, uh, so I, I got through. <laughs> and now they know there's another country in the world. So that, that was just, that's where I started. I, I could have not had a career as a Southeast Asianist had this woman not come from the other side. So sometimes you're really lucky. Now, and then, you know, on the way to the panel, something happened. I was reading this book this morning. It was published in 1952. And it says, as the physiologist Al J. Henderson used to tell his students, in science, any classification is better than no classification, provided you don't take it too seriously. And they don't tell me who the guy is, so I had to like, do a Google search and find out this is one of the most significant scientists in the 20th century, and a philosopher and a sociologist and everything else. 
And uh, the book I was reading is called Culture, a critical overview of concepts and definitions, whatever. And they point out, this was published in 1952, they point out that everybody agrees that culture is a very important concept. But once you start looking, you find out there are minimally, by 1951, 168 working definition of what culture is. So we all agree that it's important, and none of us agree what it is. And uh, I mean, I, I could say that because you know, I'm a PhD in anthropology. I know obscure stuff. But the reason I bring it up is that I'm looking at Thai identity. And everybody agrees Thai identity is super important. People get thrown in jail for saying the wrong thing about Thai identity and society, even in 2021. So we don't agree what Thai identity is, but there is a social mechanism in Thailand now to make sure that you do not broadcast opinions about it, understandings of it that are inappropriate. And uh, so I could spend 45 minutes talking about authoritarianism, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you a talk about more trivial issues. And I've been warned by Mary that at 1 o'clock, people have to go elsewhere. So my phone is going to have an obnoxious ring at 1 o'clock, and I will say, to conclude, so, so I have until then. So, so this is called Thai Plus, Sensing Gender on the Ethnic Frontier. And I did my best to try to write Thai Plus over here. Uh, and it means two things. I'm a specialist in ethnic minorities. So I've always had kind of a strange understanding of the Thai. So Thai Plus, first meaning of it is, there's more to Thai than so-called ethnic Thai people. And the other thing is, because this is on a Friday, I wanted to have something positive to say. I mean, we can talk until the cows come home about all the things that are wrong in Thailand and so on. I don't care. We don't need to, we already know that. We all know it all too well. So, I've been you know, I was trained as a Southeast Asianist in hill tribes. And the scholars who went to study hill tribes in Thailand, they were profoundly ignorant. Thailand was not colonized. There was no archive in English or Dutch or French for these foreign PhD students to know anything about anything. So all they knew about hill tribes was what they knew from anthropology about England or South America or who knows what. These are tribal people. And so they go, this starts in 1960, 62, and they, there's a, a meeting, and it is decided there are six tribes. And so let's bring in some PhD students. We need a project. And so each of them is given a tribe to study, and they find the most representative village, whatever that is, but it basically means there's no sign of any Thai entanglements here. So essentially, tribal research in Thailand is an academic fantasy about tribal people. And uh, I'm trained in this tradition. I didn't know better. I thought this was it when I went there. And uh, so we all assume that these are our innocent brown brothers and sisters, marginalized minorities, we're suffering because of the evils of the Thai state and capitalism and modernization and whatnot. And we never have to kind of recognize that these are Southeast Asian people. They have been entangled with each other for 20,000 years or longer. And they've always been in multi-ethnic networks. It has never been balkanized until the Burmese military came along in 62 and made it happen. Uh, so, but things happened in Thailand politically that are very interesting and different. But the basic point here is that we've not been looking at these kind of entanglements. So what I'm going to tell you is that Thai identity is something that is being debated left and right. There is an authoritative version, and it is not the only one. But the thing is, 
Academics are under pressure to be productive. We always are. Everybody has to file their annual reports this month. Even I was about to do it. And we have to have we have to have reliable publications. And for that, we need to have our conclusions already in hand. So basically, academics are predisposed to, to conclude what they thought. That science has this kind of confirmation bias. And we don't get the time to kind of chase after the anomalies that question our received understandings. And then some years ago, I stumbled on these things in Thai novels and in Thai film that uh, kind of led me or forced me to question everything I thought I knew. And uh, so now that I finally have a sabbatical, I'm going to try to find out. So where do I point the, the clicker? Here? So, so here's what I'm looking at, sort of ethnic relativity. What Albert Einstein says about the implications of relativity, that time and space are not separate things. They, are, they don't have a separate existence or independent existence. There's only the structural quality of the field. So, so time can become space, and space can become time and all that. And so basically, that's sort of how I sit myself down with all this stuff about different peoples in the region, the Thai and the Mian so They're commonly taken from very distinct peoples. And the way social scientists write, they assume there's a conflict of interest between the state and the minorities, and that one is more powerful than the other, and one is going to hurt the other, and, uh, and all that. So, so what I'm looking at is a combination of fiction and ethnographic reporting. It's all in Thai. One of the cases I'm dealing with has, is a short story that was translated. The rest is, is all in Thai. And I mean, every Thai knows about this, but none of them is interested. Because the people who, who kind of look at hill tribes in Thailand either want to convince you that these are uneducated, filthy savages, or they romanticize the Karen as having subsistence ethic and true eco-wisdom, and they contrast them with the evil long who are corrupt by capitalism and fertilizer and herbicide and whatnot. So it, it, it doesn't tell you anything new. It tells you what you already thought. So, so my research question is, what can happen at these ethnic intersections? What can happen? as people relate to each other. And uh, for an academic reference, Ben Anderson, 40 years ago, in his book on nationalism, said, your novels allow people, enable people, to see themselves as a part of a nation. That novels were kind of a, a significant element of making national consciousness. And then I'm looking at these novels, and I'm thinking to myself, well, it depends on what you read. These novels tell me three different things. So, so that's why I have to stick around in the library. Now, so I may be exaggerating here, but as I see it, anybody who studies Thailand is aware of Thai ethnic chauvinism. There's just no way around that. I was finding it in museum displays and elsewhere. And uh, it's only a front. There is actually a legacy of multiculturalism in Thailand and Southeast Asia that goes back 10,000 years, 227,000 years or longer. And uh, uh, I want to chase after. Here's one example of an exclusive Thai identity with the military general on top. And the hierarchy of creatures goes down to the rice farmer, the forest person, the monkey there, here. And each of them is saying, well, I'm better than you, until the rabbit says, rabbit. <laughs> because there's nothing beyond, below that. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you believe this stuff, then you may be compelled 
to take racists as representative of what can be expressed and thought in time. And uh, I find that deeply troubling. And uh, I'm wanting to get past that because you can either celebrate this kind of hierarchy and racism, or you can critique it. Whichever way you go, you end up saying, this is the most significant dynamic in this world. And I want to find another way of looking at it. So what I'm looking at is three books from the 50s and three books from the 70s. I've, I've read other stuff, but I, I'm picking examples from these because I think they, they make triangulations possible and interesting. And so the first one is an ethnography, 30 Peoples of Chiang Mai Province. The second is a kind of socially critical short story that was banned. The author had to go into exile. And the third is a frivolous jungle adventure that has sort of fantasy elements. And from the 70s, Kadapai Gurusapat, he uh, wrote an authoritative book on the hill tribes. Surachai Jantimaton, who was a folk singer at Karawan, I think it was called. He was, uh, he joined the Communist Party guerrillas in Nam province, and he wrote this novel in camp. It was approved by the Communist Party leadership. It was smuggled to Bangkok, and it was published, and it was out before he could see it. He was still in camp. And the third one is by Sifa, Momlo <coughs> Sifa under the indigo blue sky, which is kind of a romance novel about school teachers on the mountain. So this is what I'll tell you about. <coughs> so Wuntu uh, Isisawa, he was a member of parliament for Chiang Rai province. Chiang Rai is way up north. And he, uh, he and everybody else from the north was constantly faced with Thai racism that only the people in Siam were real Thai. And the rest of them were Lao or uneducated, mixed bloods, half-breeds, whatever. So he, in his book, I mean, his book is partly to call positive tourist attention and investment attention to his province. But he also insisted on the proper racial credentials of the northern Thai people. And I'll read to you. The northerners are true Thai. There has been no mixing of blood from elsewhere. All the Thai in the North think of themselves as true Thai and are unhappy that Bangkok people call them Lao. They call themselves Khon Mu, which means that they are civilized and not forest people. To the Northerners, the term Lao refers to the Thai people in Indochina. The writing of Thai histories and chronicles by Central Thai people has done an injustice to some of the same people because historically the Thai people in the Central region came from the North." Unquote. All right, <coughs> so Punchuai sees what he highlighted. He says there are three kinds of people in this land. There's Thai people, there's foreigners, Chad, and then there's hill tribes. And the Thai people have a claim on this land. The foreigners have a claim elsewhere, and the hill tribes don't have a claim on anything. And then he went on and described that these hill tribes are oversexed. I mean, the photo is jumping around here, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you all my secrets. This is Kajak by Burusapa, the guy from the 70s. And he's sitting on the maiden hugging bench in the Aka village. So this is all bogus, but there's a photo of it, so it must be true. So Bonchue Sisawa invented the notion that in the Aka village, all the women are loops, and there's a bench in the village. So the girls come out in the evening after dinner, and if there's a guy that they're interested in, they just might scurry off in the bushes and make out in the dark. And Buntu I see someone, he drew this in his book. I mean, it didn't exist. It was out of his head. Although you can trace it to James Telford, the missionary who was in the sound state of Burma in 1933. But Buntu I see someone made it into a thing. It was published in 1950. In 1963, the US government, as a part of Cold War anti-communism effort, gave a bunch of camera equipment to the Thai and said, let's you make some documentaries about the hill tribes. So the Thai people get to know each other better. 
And there's a book that describes the trip with the film crew by a Thai guy of the Bunak family. And he describes, they went there and they, they had this bench and they take photos and film to show to the Thai people that this is real. I mean, this is, this is pretty horrible fiction, but everybody thinks it's real. So I'll read you, I mean, I'm sorry for how offensive this is, but I am baffled by nobody has, none of these scholars has looked at this for seven years. I'm baffled. So I'm, in spite of this being kind of offensive, I'm going to give you the description. The household, head, the household heads in the Akka village confer among themselves in the selection of a middle-aged and vigorous man who is ideally a widower. He is selected as the Katirada, the one who initiates the maidens in the ways of sexuality. If a maiden were to refuse his advances, then her father would threaten her with the wrath of the ancestor spirits. Each maiden in the village has to be deflowered by the Katirada. If a child comes from a union with the Katirada, then the young woman's family will view it as sent from the ancestor spirits in the heaven. If the young woman has a husband but becomes pregnant, then the man must just put up with it. Were the Katirada to fall in love with one of his charges, then the villagers will disapprove and promptly release him from his duties and find a substitute for the role. Opposite to the deflowerer's role is that of Mida, a middle-aged, good-looking, widowed woman who is to initiate the young village man in the arts of sexuality. She has to instruct each and every young man in the village. The maidens on the hugging bands will not give any consideration to a young man who has not yet received his initiation. Sometimes the older people have to drag a reluctant young man by the hand for him to get his instruction in the woods." Unquote. Uh, these fabrications, in my view, are more serious and more damaging than was the so-called Longman Dictionary Scandal in 1992, where an unflattering cliché description of the city of Bangkok compelled the Thai government to call for a recall and reprint of an English language dictionary from the UK. In the Thai language, in contrast, no amount of racist, sexualized slander of Thailand's hill tribes will ever offend Thai sensibilities. I'm sorry for sermonizing here, but somebody has to say. So now on to something else. In the story Prai Fa, the uh, dust underfoot, by Lao Kam Hong, the guy who was sent into exile, the narrator is a Thai director of a logging camp in the north. The elephant keeper, Inta, is an ethnic cruel youth who works there. He's in love with Bua Kham, who is an innocent northern Thai girl from the next village. All the villagers like Inta. Then two elements of national society enter the scene. The first is a government official who is a timber inspector. He's lazy and arrogant, takes way too much time to do his job, and demands whiskey. And then I quote from the story. These law enforcement officials, conditioned by rules and regulations made to obscure responsibility, soon become petty tyrants to be approached by common people at their peril. It is rare to find a decent one." Unquote. Then the camp is visited by uh, an elite member of the family that owns the logging enterprise. And he is Mom Ratya Wong by Den Ratya Prink. So Mom Ratya Wong is a royal title, and his name, his personal name, translates like climbing royal tree, which may be a mockery, a subtle reference to him as a monkey or something. And the elite visitor makes himself comfortable, and one day he offers Chirk, the narrator, to have a drink with him. And it becomes clear that he's already slept with Bua Kham. And so the guy in camp wants to warn him off and all that, that uh, there's another man, there's a, one of his men in camp is in love with her. And the elite guy says, you seem to begin to forget your place. I am Mom Ratawong, Pai Ben what I have to do with that bitch poor come is my own affair, unquote. Chirp uh, wants to protest, but our elite visitor refers to the crew guy as subhuman, as a stupid savage, and so on. And then, in the story, it's evening, and it's raining really hard, and the river is rising, there's a thunderstorm, and after midnight, people heard a piercing cry and the cause of somebody urging on an elephant. The next morning, when the flood has receded and the storm is down, the villagers find the remains of a hut and two washed up bodies on the riverbank. Inta is gone for good, and the author doesn't need to spell out that he had had his elephant push the hut with Baipi and Borkan into the river during the storm and then just scurry off to Laos. A different Thai image of the ethnic frontier is in the 
series long prior uh, the jungle adventures, jungle trails. A story called Chao Pen Din, Lord of the Land, by Malai Chupinin, published in 55. And it's centered on three men, uh, two Thai and one Korean. The uh, Sak Suryan is the narrator. His Korean name is Dakun, Old Gun, and there's a Thai army captain, Roy E. Ruan Yutana, who is a former soldier. And uh, Gun, the Korean guy, he sometimes has a new wife, sometimes he has more than one. Sak is not married, doesn't have a girlfriend, and shows no apparent romantic or sexual interest throughout the series, which is like 2,700 pages. Gurn is quite the flirt, and as such, he's Sak's opposite. And uh, so Sak is the narrator, and as a Thai male lead, he's not a hero, he's not a strong man, he's not a romantic success or nothing. So he's kind of baffling. So in, sorry, in one of the stories, the three guys are kind of held up because Gurn is really fascinated with this Korean girl in the village, and she's this very pretty young woman who is the daughter of the headman, and she works in the office of the logging camp. And in the story, it says, you know, it is the Thai custom when a young Korean woman has two suitors who are rivals, that she can set them challenges, and then she'll marry the champion. And uh, so they find out there's going to be a test, a contest. The two guys according to the current custom, have to climb a tall tree after dark and bring down a beehive. So the headman is explaining this to Sak. And he said, you know, sometimes there's not even a wedding afterwards. Why is that? Oh, well, the two guys have fallen to their deaths. So I mean, it's, it's irreverent. And it's sort of doing, sort of making up current customs as, uh, as they go. And, uh, so Gunn says, you know, I might as well die if I can't have this woman. So he's got to do it. And then he uses trickery to get the other guy, his rival, who's a very young, handsome, capable man, to get him too drunk to really complete his task. But then it misfires. The other guy, he becomes an angry drunk, frustrated and dangerous. So he brings fire to an orchard near the village. And the forestry official who is there yells out to be careful that the fire might endanger the forest. And the young man says, and why should I care? This is not our forest. The officials are the owners of the forest. And the forestry official answers, that is incorrect. All the people own this forest. It is not just the logging company that has the license to it. It is not just people like me who have come here for work. It also belongs to everyone else. Whether it's the Korean or the Thai, we together are owners of this forest and owners of this land. Uh, whether we want it for shade or to make a living, the forest fire can destroy more or less all of it. Please don't endanger it. Mawa, the drunk man, laughed like he had lost his mind. He looked at the assembled and said, everybody here is my enemy. There is not a friendly face. Uh, old uncle is a cheat. Damori is a cheat. Bayuida is a cheat, 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 cheat. And then he ran off into the woods. And the wind picked up, and the fire got out of control and burned down all the orchards and the fields. The next day, Sak, who is our narrator, saw the village headman stand alone in the middle of the village with glazed eyes. And, and he said, all the orchards are wasted. All the hill fields are wasted. Mawa destroyed it all. What are we going to eat? And Sak responds, there's taro in the ground, tapioca, wild tubers. There's still fish in the rivers. There are birds to hunt. There's game in the forest. There's no reason to fear starvation. You are right. For as long as we live on Thai land, we shall not starve. And says Sak, this land brings us happiness. We have to join hands to make sure it will still be our land. If we all work together to protect the forest, then the land will provide for us. And says the Korean village headman, I will never forget this. The forest manager said it. He understands that all the people are owners of the forest. All the people are the owners of this Thai land." Unquote. So these three examples from the 50s give you a field of interaction from three different angles and with three different outcomes. Bunchoe Sisawat, uh, his sexual fantasy is a particular kind of fantasy across the ethnic frontier. But his work declares that hill peoples are aliens on Thai soil and his descriptions all imply the superiority of the Thai people. The lack of inter-ethnic equality is just a fact. The hill tribes don't belong here. 
Lao Kam Hoang's short story uh, conjures up the virtue, the innocent goodness and virtue of Inta, the elephant keeper. His love is, is sincere and single-minded. Bua Kam is an easy prey to the arrogant and corrupt elite visitor who feels free to take things and people for his enjoyment and then toss them afterwards. The elite man views himself as a superior being and not beholden to anyone. The forest inspector is a minor version of his arrogance in the sense of entitlement. The innocent goodness of the common people and their suffering at the hands of officials and the elite demonstrate the inherent evils of hierarchy in Thai society. In the long Pry fiction, The Jungle Adventures, nothing is certain about the difference between Thai and Korean or other hill peoples. The Thai main character is not a hero. He's not superior to his Korean mate. For all that Gurn has a string of girlfriends, or women throughout the series, there's never an indication that any of these women is sexually abused, nor that men in general are like him. When the stories were published in the 50s, the Prime Minister of Thailand had mandated that Thai males in Thai fiction not have extramarital affairs. It is against the law. The writer Malay Chupinit was among many authors who was incensed by the Prime Minister's interference in the alphabet, what letters could be used, what characters could be used, what kind of action could be described, and so on. They were all pretty outraged. And, but when I read the Long Pai stories, I slowly realized that there was never any indication that hill people were different or strange. Nor was there anything suggesting that Thai people were superior as Thai, as educated, as urban, as Buddhist, as upper class, nothing. And Sak Suryan, the main character, the narrator, declares in one of the stories, quote, as for myself, I can say this, the forest is the kingdom of my life and the field of my life. Every year I must leave and seek it out. If I stay too long in the city, then I'm like a tree that is in the wrong place. City life weighs me down and drains my mind. The city and I cannot mix for too long at a time. It is not peaceful and refreshing like the enlightenment ariyatam that I derive from the forest and the forest people." Unquote. So Sak makes this comment plainly, and the attitude rings true for the character in the whole series. It's as striking as the equivalence between the Thai and the Korean in the other story, and the declaration that the two peoples together are owners of this land and this forest. So nothing flags the ethnically non-Thai as strange, as other, or as un-Thai. Now, the three perspectives in these books that I've been finding here are simultaneous, alternative, and contradictory. I find them convincing. There is not a single Thai perspective on identity and difference. Instead, there's a range of alternative perspectives that are equally plausible. Their social implications differ. The three views belong to the same discursive universe. They are expressions of a Thai divergence about society, identity, equality and voice. So here's, so I, I tried to kind of clarify this with ideal types, perspective A, B, and C. So A, Thai and Hill peoples are fundamentally different. Thai are superior, and Hill peoples lack knowledge and morals and so on. Their mixings would be to the detriment of the superior Thai. And the meaning is hierarchy, inequality, is central on a great thing. And the opposite perspective, B, some Thai and Hill peoples are different. The Thai elite and official don't are, uh, oppressive and socially damaging. This contrast with the innocent of country folk. Their mixing would be the detriment of the virtuous rural people. And here, hierarchy, inequality is central and a bad thing. And C, Thai and Hill peoples, or the city and the countryside, may differ but are equivalent. In no way is one superior to the other or inherently a threat to the other. Their mixing is ordinary and does not pose any predictable outcomes. Hierarchy, inequality is or are neither central nor so important. And, uh, and then this range of this different set, this set of different views reoccurs later in books that I have been reading from the 70s. So here's the guy, Kachatai Burusapa. He wrote the book Hill Tribes. That was published in 1976 and won some national award. It was republished in 1985 and a third edition in 1990. 
This photo is in the first two. This photo is absent from 1990. But anyway, Kazat by he is, uh, has had a long administrative career in security, immigration, minorities, refugees, and the like. He has represented Thailand to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. And he's, his last promotion was like a year or two ago. It's, it's on the internet. He's, he's still there. Nothing is his, in his text would contradict border anxieties or authoritarian integration and suppression measures that will come common in the 70s and 80s. And I, I don't want to spend my noon time talking about him exclusively. Uh, uh, so there's a very different perspective. Uh, this is one of my Dambuan friends from Cambodia in 1992. It so happened. Since, since it came up already. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about a different perspective that is in uh, Surachai Jantimaton's novel, Before the Light of Day, from 1981. So he joined the Communist Party guerrillas in camp in Nam province, and his novel is written there. Uh, and the focus is on the suffering of the Lawat Hill people from Thai officialdom. And I'm reading. One day, an official, Gamnanti, visited the village. I've come to see how you all are doing. His Highness has sent me to point out the matter of taxes. Now listen well. For the progress and improvement of our local area, His Highness is the lord of the land, and declares that for making fields in the hills or valleys, there's a tax of seven baht a year. For large trees, the tax is 20 baht. Mid-sized, 15 baht. Small ones, 5 baht. The tax for making alcohol is 25 baht. The cold season tax is 2 baht. The legal code tax is 2 baht. For selling a buffalo, the tax is 15 baht. For selling a pig, 25 baht. For tea, which is very valuable, the tax is 20 baht. For, but for a large tree, it's 50 baht. The voice of the law was loud and went on for much longer until people couldn't keep up. And it looked like no one could remember it all. But everyone stood there silently listening to Gamman Tee, who was like the main actor in some theater play." Unquote. In the story, the confrontations gradually get more serious, while all that the Lawa want is justice. They pay tax, but they get nothing in return. Their promised school, for which they were taxed extra, did not materialize. At the end of the story, two of the village men have been sent away to prison, and there's no end to injustices. The novel rests on an absolute contrast between oppressors and oppressed. The authorities are abusive, uncaring, and unjust. The Lawa villagers have a keen sense of justice, they love freedom, they work hard, they've always behaved properly and diligently, including all the work they did at the request of MMP. They look forward to having a school so the kids could learn to read and write and come into new kinds of knowledge. All their hopes were dashed because of neglect, disregard, and abusive patterns of rule. The traditions of the Lawat people include the notion of a holy man who will inspire resistance and rebellion by those who are impoverished and impressed. And, uh, Surachai Jantimaton, he, he wrote a short story that was published in 1980 in Kriva San in the pamphlet of the Communist Party. The story is set in a Lawat village, and uh, this guy, this Lawat villager, he had joined the Thai like border guard or military, or whatever, and his wife is home alone and things aren't going well, so he goes, he sneaks home to help her, and then two Thai soldiers come. And they start giving them a hard time, and they're verbally abusive and threatening. And in the end, the Lawat couple kill them and ditch them and scurry off into Laos. And the story says, after a while, people will have forgotten, and, uh, and they can come back. And to me, the plot is much like that of Dust Underfoot there when I told you about the Kumu elephant keeper, of an absolute contrast between innocent goodness and oppressive arrogance that can only end in deadly violence. So I'll tell you the third perspective. The novel is Under the Indigo Blue Sky by C. Farr from 1977. It offers a very different take on inter-ethnic relations in Thailand. It centers on Li Jiang, who is a Hmong from the mountains in Chiang Rai, and Matsi, who is a Thai from Bangkok. They fall in love in teachers' college in the south, and uh, once they graduate, then Matsi decides against her mother's visit, her mom is in tears, that they shall get married and then she will help him run a school in the Hmong mountain village. This is what Li Zheng has set his mind to. Quote, I want my people to progress to the same degree as your Thai people, because later on, we will have to live on your society's terms. There's no way 
of going on living like a backwards people of the forest of the past. Uh, most of his schoolmates have no knowledge of Thailand's internal diversity. I think he must be a foreigner. And one of them asks him, which movie country are you from, Taiwan or Hong Kong? And he says, I'm Hmong. My ethnicity is Hmong. My nationality is Thai. So when I read this novel, I was totally surprised, including by the sprinkling of Hmong words and phrases that are translated into Thai in footnotes. The novel asks the question, what happens when a woman gets pregnant? And it plays out two scenarios. Soon after settling in the village, Matsi finds out that an unmarried Hmong woman cannot give birth at her parents' home, but she has to go to the forest outside the village for the birth, and is not allowed to come back. Religion and kinship intersect to marginalize single mothers. Matsi is appalled and offers a home to the young village woman who has just given birth. Here, the reader senses some basic inequality and injustice as a part of Hmong culture. To Hmong men, such as Li Zheng, this is just the Hmong way. He can't see a problem regarding the inferior position of women in his society. And he thinks that if a woman will not name the father of her child, then that is her problem. Later, Mati is pregnant, and this sets in motion some of the main drama in the novel. She doesn't feel up to giving birth in Chiang Rai, so she goes to Bangkok to give birth and then to recover at her parents' house. And five months later, she returns to the village, and a lot has happened in the meantime. A Hmong separatist faction had visited, wanting to inspire the establishment of a colony independent of Thailand and Laos. Yang Ge, the Hmong woman among the leaders of that group, then has an affair with Li Zheng. Some of Li Zheng's close relatives were among those inspired to establish a Hmong territory. The migration group was later ambushed, and many people were killed. In the story, the violence is out of view, and the identity of the attackers isn't clear. When Matsi finally comes back to the village, Li Zheng is away. He'd gone to find out about this violence and the fate of his relatives. When he returned, he was busy conveying information in Hmong to the villagers, and Matsi didn't understand a word. Then the villagers leave them for the night. Matsi felt hurt and betrayed by Li Zheng. He countered that she had left him and that he couldn't tell if she was ever going to return. She had never informed him of her plans. Matsi now had to choose, in his words, between the child growing up without a father or without the urban society that Matsi was used to. In truth, both of these are important, she said. She mumbled something quietly, and then she added, I'll tell you tomorrow, Li Zheng. Tomorrow I will have arrived at an answer for you. Tomorrow. And then she was silent. Maybe the cold air outside would not manage to undo the warmth inside the house. Outside, the sky had turned bright indigo blue, and the moonlight made visible two little birds that had flown in from somewhere, blown about by the cold wind. And that's how it ends. Uh, if you need a 750-page novel, <laughs> it's, it's there. In a different novel called Wild Rice, Cow Not Now, the same author explored Thai racism or colorism. In a story that focuses on two daughters of a Thai hired wife near a US Army base in Thailand's Northeast during the Vietnam War. Uh, the girl's subsequent life in Bangkok is the focus. They have two different American fathers. One girl is dark-skinned, and the other is light-skinned. And then they get adopted, and drama happens. I won't summarize the story here, but I'll just tell you, take my word for it. Uh, it is uh, perceptive, lively, illuminating, and unromantic in ways that outshine a lot of Western social science about Thai society and Thai culture. Both novels, Tai Fa Si Khan and Khao Mo Na, won national awards in the late 70s. And both, within a year of coming out, were made into very well done, very commercially successful movies. So this is well over 40 years ago, and nobody's been paying attention. I find this stuff really interesting. So Thai popular culture that aims to entertain has often been dismissed as nam nam, as trash, or dishwater by scholars. My two cents worth of dishwater writing is as follows. This is the only setting where I've found that the Thai and the Karen, or the Thai and the Mong, are equal and have an equal claim on Thai land. As an entertaining fantasy, it raises no eyebrows. It is not taken seriously. 
Meanwhile, politician Buntue Sisawat is still celebrated for stating in 1950 and after that the Thai and the Hill people are unequal and the Hill people have no claim to rights, recognition, and land. His book with the racist, sexualized slander has been reprinted many times. And in 2004, it made the list of 100 books all Thais should read. I'm not making this up. So, so the three different perspectives here on Thai social order are simultaneous, alternative, and apart. And you want to sort of sit around with some historian to say, is there something about the 50s that brings this out? Is there something about the 70s? Or is this just uh, continually happening and nobody's looking? So one of my basic points here is that debates on Thai identity and society as either an inclusive thing and diverse or exclusive and singular is something that, uh, you know, it would be it would be fascinating to look at this in Southeast Asian context to kind of counter the temptations of Thai exceptionalism. Uh, so I'm almost done. So I've, I've been reading about 20, 25 novels, and I've watched about three dozen films. I hope to go to Thailand in a month or two or three and stay until the end of summer to find some uh, more things, but, uh, <clears throat> but I, I want to end with this area studies fantasy. I mean, I, I went to a graduate school that had a Southeast Asia program right here. The only difference between there and here is that there we meet on Thursdays and here you meet on Fridays. But the, the absolute delight and bafflement of going to weekly talks and hearing something about agronomy or Cambodian dance or Indonesian authoritarianism. These things that you don't necessarily focus on yourself can be really valuable. And I just want to kind of close with that area studies fantasy that you know we can all learn from each other. Thank you.